Be all right. Be humming along just like you did. Mm -hmm. you, you, you were such a beautiful singing voice. I wish you, you, you exhibited more. You can't help to do that, but right? That's what Baraka does to us. Not in this space. This mm. is no, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not I'm not as um mm. uh as confident. Oh, it's as, not confidence. Everybody sings, but you got a beautiful voice. You should thank you. Thank you. No, uh, no, no, no. But um, yeah, thank you for this. Thank you. Good morning. Uh good morning, everyone. Good everything. Good everything. Mm -hmm. I'm just I'm now processed. Now you got me thinking. I'm sitting here. Oh, and the and through 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 the music, um, the spirit the spirit gets awakened, and I'm thinking about you know coochie pink and booty hole brown, and that that uh, and and I'm thinking about Badida and how how that has so much more resonance today than this. No question. <sighs> well, but Walker has us thinking his 89th birthday today. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mary Baraka. Woman yeah. Leroy Jones with that, with that, uh, he, he often did that as we know, but that that little thread that that body died, of course, is uh John Coltrane equinox. Yeah. So he he and Monk, I think those were two of his favorites. He would he would lace them in there. <laughs> but, but the power of, of song beat to deliver messages is has been like I, I feel like that was how the uh the Haitian Revolution happened, right? Drum beats and 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 song uh carry messages that's right, right. That's right. Uh, and now the messages we carry are <laughs> ridiculous Got and it. it's intentional because yeah. the delivery system for us of course our cultural meaning making is is very powerful so when you front load it with uh foolishness then it has devastating effect give me my theme music so, oh, so we, we were having this conversation on Foolishness Friday yesterday, and um, you know, the the, the I won't even say her name in this space because I feel like it's cussing. I'm not gonna cuss in this space. <laughs> uh, but you know, there's there's this rapper who's saying some things, and you oh, know, I think I know who you're talking about. Yeah, that's a, that's where you know that's where I, the the, Unfortunately, problem, the fact that I know it right, it, and that was my point. You know, and I, when I was like, I don't even know this person, and then when they said. Coochie Pink, Booty Hole Brown. I was like, I know that song. And then I was mad at myself for knowing it, right? And then <laughs> and we were having this conversation about plants. Like, you know, the the plant for little Kim was Nikki, and then Cardi came to supplant Nikki, and then this, the next generation. And it's like, who's planting? You know, as we talk about seeding what we want to grow, they're actually seeding among us. And I was like, do the plants know that they're plants? Or do they just think they are talented and, and lucky? Or that you know that they're they're blessed. You know, do they know that they're planted to do a thing, and and if they don't know, what's their responsibility? Or they figured out how to. In fact, there's a new book I was just. Oh, I'm thinking about using it for my hip hop class, and I don't see it right here. But it's about the business of hip hop, and of course, there are a lot of books on, on that subject. But uh, this was one of the latest ones that talks about how all this stuff is curated. And I mean, shout out to Nicki Minaj and to Lil Nas X for understanding that this has nothing to do with talent. No matter how much confidence people may have in their own talent, this is about can you ride the wave? Can you surf the algorithm? I mean, who's <laughs> going to be the next NBA young boy? Who's going to be the next blue face? Who's going to be, you know? And meanwhile, the people get dumber and dumber and dumber. But you can stack that coin. After all, it's in, a, in our aspiration to be a to be an N-word in Paris and ball so hard. MF's got to find me. <laughs> but first they got to find me. <laughs> What's 50 grand to an MF like me? Would you please remind me? In other words, I'm trying to make, or, you know, in the words of Kanye, let's get lost tonight. <laughs> you can be my black Kate Moss tonight. <laughs> Praise secretary, I'm the boss tonight. <laughs> in other words, this, the whole aspiration is oblivion. They don't know it as that. They know it as material comfort and creature comfort. And when you ask how much is enough, they say more, more is enough. This is the cancer of capitalism, which some people think can be reformed. Ha, badida. Ha, badida, equina, which is actually the point. It always comes back to the balance. That is really the comedic concept of my eye. Every action has a reaction, and ultimately, it's always going to retreat to the mean, which is why that conversation you were having with the sister on how civil wars start, I think, was fascinating because you don't get it, do you? This bill was run up, which means it must come due. There's nothing... You can do. You got to pay this bill. 
I, I promise you, uh, you know, I don't come into these these uh, discussions with people. I, I saw a TED Talk and I said, oh, I want to have a conversation with someone who has studied civil wars for 30 years, 400 wars. And she, you know, is coming with a set of knowledge. And I want to unpack because I've concluded that the war never ended. So I want to have this conversation. I don't do any pre-interviews. I'm not going to give you any insight into like I'm expecting you to kind of know. So even before we went on the air, I said, I want to have a conversation today, not talking points. This is not going to be a remix of your TED talk, we, you know, or your book. I want to have a conversation about where we are. And she said, I'm ready. So we get in and I'm like, you probably aren't ready. And I realized somewhere through she was not ready for that conversation. No. And I was I was on the verge of feeling bad. But then I'm like, your whole mission is mm -hmm. around you know, pre presenting this narrative in many different forms, but it's a false narrative when we don't acknowledge that we're still in war. And if we're still in war, what's your responsibility? Because you're on the other side. And I said to her, your whiteness and your weddedness to this whiteness is in opposition to my very life. It, it, it threatens my very life. Right. And as long as you hold on to that, we're going to always be at war, right? We're going to always be at war because mm. I can't exist in a world where I'm always diminished because you're holding on to something that doesn't really exist. So we're going to have to reconcile with that. And, she, you know, it was like, I could see the, and, and but, at the and same time, so my people came here from other places and I fought my way through and do, I can give up my whiteness, but do I have to give up my dreams and aspirations? I mean, can I get my foot off your neck? I, I didn't put my foot on your neck. I mean, it, it, is this a foot even? I mean, in this social structure, I mean, what do we say? What do we mean? I mean, can't we just be individuals? I mean, we've got work to do. What? The bill, yo, the bill was run up. Do you understand the bill was run up? Why is we Americans? That's the question that Mary Baraka is asking. Why? Why? And Tell who, me why. And and who is me? Who well, is me? I mean, the me, the me is interesting. Uh, Ira Berlin, uh, maybe about ten years ago, wrote a little small book. Actually, gives a series of lectures. He's he's an ancestor now, called "The Long Emancipation." And he said the thing about this war, and I know he absolutely did not mean it to this to where I'm going to take it, but that's okay because I couldn't. Hmm, Maybe I could care less. But anyway, I don't know. The point is this. He said that when you declare war, like the war that was declared on African people, um, there was never a start in terms of an official war. It's not like a war we're fighting where you say we declare war. You no, know, you just came in and invaded and over centuries did this. It was asymmetrical, meaning there weren't two armies fighting each other. We were unaware of what Spain, what became Spain, Portugal, France, England were planning as these people came out and traded and then developed a buffer class by having sex with the African women on the on the coast and then penetrating, playing small uh, 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 conflicts into larger ones, supplying one side with arms and then the other side come to the fort and you give them arms. And all the while you're pulling people out because nobody knows what y'all talking about in Lisbon and London. Nobody knows what you're talking about in Paris. Y'all are doing it. And then he said, so it's asymmetrical. Metrical. And then the other thing he said was, it was never a truce declared. So in other words, we never sat at the table as African people globally and said, okay, there's a truce. Why? Because y'all never had a truce. You know, people say, oh, the British uh, were the leaders of emancipation. No, the British understood that their economic interests no longer required them to have North American colonies like they did. So they shifted it to the continent. And then they used their Navy to try to stop the other European countries from taking us out. This was not an act of humanitarianism. All of this is cold blooded social structure, modern world system, pragmatic effort. And so so when we say war as a metaphor, the war presumes that there are two sides equally armed or equipped who are fighting each other. No, 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 no. There's one side, Europe. We are we we are literally convened as a figment of the European imagination and as fodder for this capitalist world system. Now, if we want to get out of that. We can. We have to. But we have to ask the first order question. What are the terms? You know, that's why this, this African States framework is so important. We have to separate the social structure from the governance structure. Even though they are commingled and we live in both every day, we have to separate them out conceptually. Otherwise, we will still use social structure language to try to talk about our aspirations. And that's how you end up with minstrelsies. Minstrel. People thinking a millionaire is going to save us. It's not going to happen. And and it requires our ignorance. You know, I've been I've been deep in Noam Chomsky, uh, yeah. playing a lot of Noam Chomsky on the on the show, and watching a lot of Noam Chomsky videos, and reading a lot of his interviews. And you know, and and as you put this this the 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 puzzle together, and and then step back from it, you realize exactly what you're saying. Because Chomsky talked about Reagan, 
who has, you know, who is a hero. Uh, he said he was a, a vicious racist whose domestic policies were a war on black bodies no and way. a continuation of slavery. And then I took it back to, of course, Nixon before Reagan. Reagan just said, hold my beer to Nixon. But Nixon and oh, Ehrlichman, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Nixon and Ehrlichman, Ehrlichman said, we have two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. And I'm like, how are black people the enemy of, of a whole administration? Wow. So we have to, we have to flood, you know, the, the community, black community with heroin. And then we're going to, you know, hippify the anti-war left and give them the marijuana. And then we got to criminalize both. And then that set us on this war on drugs that Reagan then picked up the baton and said, I can go even further. Come on, Nancy, let's go ahead and tell people. And then let's rip up the black community three, four generations, and then blame them <laughs> for everything that happens. And listen, I'm not giving anyone a free pass to take drugs and it's not your fault. Yes, we do have some personal responsibility, but if there was an entire war dependent upon your ignorance and your, your, your uh, being out of your mind on these drugs and destruction of your community, you got to fight every day. We have to fight every day and acknowledge that this is what is happening. We can't ignore it. And then we can't blame people for the conditions that they find themselves in as if we we brought the drugs in, as if That's we were part of the Nixon administration that had a domestic policy that called us the enemy of it. Black people absolutely. in the anti-war left, people that didn't want war. So I'm just like, at some point, we're going to have to educate ourselves and sit in that for mm -hmm. a minute and then start to build the systems while we at the same time engage in this criminal enterprise. But yes. we can't we can't well, tap out and start and, and, and stop starting from scratch. Maybe stop starting from scratch. Meaning what? I mean, Noam Chomsky, as brilliant as he is, deeply rooted, a brilliant intellectual, of course, cut his academic eye teeth in linguistics and, you know, continues to live. He's out there in Arizona now, who really burst on the political scene as a commentator and analyst in the 60s, as you say, with the Vietnam War, the new Mandarins, all his work there. And uh, which really is the Johnson administration, Kennedy and Johnson. And then, as you say, comes into Nixon and has been pushing this all along ever since. No doubt, un undeniably brilliant. And then you look at somebody like Gil Scott Herring, who, as far as I'm concerned, is in some ways by order of magnitude more brilliant yes. than uh, Noam Chomsky, not to be comparing, but to also say that this man is a black man and he's a person of African descent, which means he's in this mess. And when he says in his... Uh, in his song slash poems, uh, dot, dot, did it, dot, dot, dash, uh, the ghetto code, when he's critiquing the Nixon administration, and he says, in the 1970s, Halderman, uh, Ehrlichman, Nixon, and Dean, it follows a pattern, if you know what I mean. Halderman, Ehrlichman, Nixon, and Dean, it follows a pattern, if you know what I mean. And then in his song, B Movie, where he goes through all of the administrations, he says, you know, uh, lined up by all the billionaires necessary. He talks about all of them. And then he goes through and he talks about um, uh, um, um, Hague, Alexander the Hague, running the, the inmates, running the asylum. He's in B movie laying all this out. And then he even talks about George Papa Doc Bush. Wait a minute. George Papa Doc Bush. George W. Bush, the son of George H.W. Bush, is a teenager when Gil Scott Heron calls his father Papa Doc. That's not even a baby doc yet. Gil Scott Heron is so brilliant. It's like he's prophetic. He's going to say, and then they're going to bring his son in. And so I'm saying all that to say that, you know, there's a new Max Roach documentary that, that just came out. In fact, it debuted yesterday and people can, can watch it. Uh, it was on PBS, American Masters, Max Roach, the drum also waltzes. And it goes through Max Roach coming through the 40s with Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and Miles Davis and Sonny Rollins and all. And then you see Jimmy Heath and Sonny Rollins himself talk about how, you know, these musicians would go on stage and they'd need a little something. Uh, Gerald Horn writes about this brilliantly in his book, Jazz and Justice, about this series, because you see the organ organized crime trying to take advantage of these brothers and sisters, Mary Lou Williams, you know, trying to take advantage of these brothers and sisters, Sarah Vaughn. And then he says, you know, so marijuana was known. They say Louis Armstrong smoked marijuana every day of his life. But then he said, uh, then cocaine came in, but cocaine was like a New Year's Eve drug. That's for rich people. And he said, and then this thing showed up that was dirt cheap, that would get you high immediately, that had no smell to it, and that was heroin. Heroin. 
and it took out a whole generation. All of them, black or white, Stan Getz got strung out on her, but Sonny Rollins got strung out, Max Roach, all these cats, John Coltrane. I mean, you know, Miles Davis. In fact, you know, Miles Davis, when he got clean, he put John Coltrane out the band because the thing hit him. It, it threatened to destroy a generation of our cultural meaning makers in this country. But what happened? Max Roach is in there and he's strung out and then he's in the hospital because he didn't got arrested. I mean, his mom comes and he says, you know, I'm sorry. He said, you got these calluses on your knees because you on your you on your uh, your knees scrubbing these floors for these white folks. And she said, no, son, my knees are not callous because I've been scrubbing floors for white people. My knees are callous because I've been on the on the on the ground praying for you to beat this. And that and he says, you know, he's in the hospital. When he gets the news that Maxine was born, his daughter. And Max Roach kicked it. Sonny Rollins for a year did day labor in and around New York City, kicked it, practicing under the bridge in Brooklyn every day on his horn, wouldn't record nothing. He comes back, records saxophone Colossus. And that generation pulled itself back from the brink. And what the documentary shows is in 1960, it's, it's Max Roach with Abby Lincoln, his wife, with uh, uh, Babatunde Olatunji and Sonny Rollins. They record the Freedom Now Suite. Max Roach said they slaughtered those kids in, in South Africa in Sharpville. We're going to do something about it. And that Freedom Now Suite becomes the opening to this decade of black power music that comes in. And then, so here we are in 2024, we've forgotten that we beat these people once, but then once you beat them, they don't stop. They come back with another thing and they cut off your memory that you beat them the last time. John Coltrane beat them the last time. Mary Lee Williams beat them. Sonny Rollins, Sonny Rollins still alive. You know, you, you beat them. And then for the rest of his life, Max Roach continues that one of his sons says, you know, what fuel my father was rage. He had to do this. And then Harry Belafonte says Max Roach was who he was. He wasn't trying to become something. He already was that. Now, what he was trying to do is share it with the rest of us. And what you see walking through that is that we beat these people. You know, we, th this stuff that we're producing now out of the genius of our cultural meaning making, this isn't a critique of the genius. What is a critique of is exactly what you said. We don't have a momentum of memory. So the foolishness bonds to our DNA like that heron bonded to them. So how do we kick it? You don't kick it by playing with it. This got to be cut off. You got to go cold turkey. You got to do what Miles Davis did. Go to his daddy's farm in St. Louis and suburbs and say, look, I'm here. Lock me up upstairs and I just got to beat this. It's got to be like Ray Charles. I got to beat this. It's got to be like Max Roach and Sonny Rollins. I got to beat this because guess what? It took out Charlie Parker, the genius who gave us everything we had. They Charlie Parker was dead. It killed him. We can't let that happen. Now, here we are looking at our young people, looking at our old people, and what are we celebrating? We put the drugs in the song. Let the drugs is in the song, yo. So, <laughs> I, I was telling you I'm obsessed with Top Boy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Lamont King introduced it. I was like, I'm not watching another drug thing. Now it's in London. Now you got me in London. And first of all, what I was uh, it, just, I'm, I'm obsessed with, first of all, the, the storytelling is amazing. The, mm. the writing is brilliant and there's no N words. They don't call each other. They still shoot each other in the face and kill each other. But they don't call each, they call each other bruv and fam as they kill each other. But what I was, you know, what I'm obsessed with right now is how that is the thing that we present, but we don't talk about the poison and how it destroys the community. We we focus on these stories, these human interest stories of people rising up and making money and, and you know, trying to have lives. But what is it doing to the culture? What is it doing to the culture? And and it's in The Wire. It's in Godfather of Harlem. It's in Snowfall. It's in, like, and we're inundated. And then it's in the music. So when you're a little kid in any of these neighborhoods anywhere in the world, which I didn't know how in how we're so tied globally because that's the same narrative because it, it flows through the music, right? It's in the beat. It's in the beat. And so little kids in London and little kids in Africa and little kids all over the globe aspire to that, not to the greatness of what we are because this is the momentum of memory carried through the music, through something we don't even control. So I'm... I'm, I'm well, something we produce and, and, they, and, they, and they control we what we hear. We don't control turning it. the knobs down. Right. Okay. Even with even with this, you know, streaming, we don't control it. We don't control it. I was talking with Laurie about it because I'm like, this has to be the conversation we're having. How do we build? How do we build? How do we, uh, you know, uh, reverse engineer when this is so prevalent? And what do you tell a child 
who you make minimum wage or carry this food as they call it or carry these drugs or sell these drugs to your people. And then we blame them, you know, we're disgusted by them. And then, you know, and Biggie says, don't get high on your own supply. So we have some crack rules. We got, it, it, it has to be this conversation on, on, under a drum beat, you know, like, I you mean, yeah, know. I mean, that's like you say, the 10 crack commandments is brilliant. It is a brilliant poison. And the dope that Biggie was hand to hand herb hustling in Brooklyn turned into sonic dope. Shout out to Sean Combs. And wow. the, right. you know, the sonic dope did it. And so when he says, you know, the 10 crack commandments, right, there's there's a there's a way of knowing in there that is absolutely powerful, but it is wedded and bonded to the thing that is killing us. Isn't it lovely when the one who loves things is the one